Hafei. I'm Crystal Paco reporting from Hilton, Guam. Uh, this is a Sunday, so it's unusual to have a press conference. Uh, we're preparing to hear from the Hope and Healing Guam nonprofit group. Again, if you remember just earlier this month, uh, this nonprofit, again, separate from the Archdiocese of Agania, it was established with the, the purpose to address clergy sexual abuse claims. And most importantly, for those victims who don't want to go through the lengthy legal battle. And so the nonprofit, you call their, their hotline number, it's a 188 number, you call them, they get you help, and they also will settle your claims. They'll be responsible for investigating your claims and getting you that help, getting you in touch with psychologists, getting you spiritual guidance. And so we're moments out from hearing leadership, uh, they're going to announce leadership, and we actually saw already a little preview of who might that leadership be. Uh, earlier this month when they, they announced the establishment of the nonprofit, we heard that their executive director was California attorney Michael Cispino. You actually see him behind me. He's back there. He's, um, he's the executive director, named as executive director, and then we were told that members of the board who would be addressing those claims would be announced at a later date. Um, we also learned last week that it wouldn't just be one board, but it would be two boards and one seven-member board, and those individuals would be responsible for addressing claims, while a three-member board would be responsible for overseeing Mr. Caspino and his role as executive director. Again, they want this to be a very transparent nonprofit. Oh, thanks for everyone for tuning in. Again, we're moments out. Uh, I see Mr. Caspino in the background. Again, if you're just tuning in, we are getting ready to hear an announcement relative to the chairman, or the chairwoman in this case, for Hope and Healing Guam. That's a nonprofit established to address clergy sex abuse claims. Uh, again, we're at the Hilton today. It's a Sunday afternoon if you're tuning in from Off Island. If you're tuning in from Off Island. And let's go, I guess, maybe head in and wait. But again, this nonprofit, um, I've already spoken with Mr. Caspino early, or last week, and he said that a lot of people are calling in. They're calling in that hotline number. They want to get help. Uh, to date, there's, there's almost, or there's over 50 victims who filed in the courts, who filed their civil complaints in the courts and are suing for clergy sex abuse. But again, um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of issues when you go to court. Hi, hi, Auntie Shelly. Hi, Mom. Um, there's a lot of issues when you go to court. It could be a lengthy legal battle. It's expensive. It's uh, traumatizing for victims. You have to take the stand again. And so a lot of people are actually even filing under their just their initials because it can be embarrassing. It can be humiliating. And even so, that these things happened years ago, decades ago. Uh, again, this all started when um, the first victim surfaced. And that was uh, Roy Quintanita, and he was followed by uh, Walter Denton, if you remember. That was last summer. So a lot, we've come a long way in the last year, if I, if, I, if I say my opinion. Yeah, we've come a long way in the last year where the first victim came out, and now we're almost 60, almost 60 plaintiffs to file suit. Multi, oh, so, much, so many millions of dollars, because all of attorney David Lujan's clients, they have upped their damages from $5 million per plaintiff to $10 million. Half a day, Mr. Pareda, a Sunday news conference. Yes, I am very surprised myself. Uh, again, we are here at the Hilton. I understand that Mr. Caspino may be staying here. Um, we are going to hear about leadership for Hope and Healing Guam. Again, this, this, this nonprofit, I'm not sure everyone sold on it. I'm not sure if everyone sold on the nonprofit. Uh, we got a lot of criticism from attorney David Lujan early this week. Um, we also, I, I read somewhere that SNAP may also be criticizing this nonprofit, but let's go and see. Let's just check it out. Is it the end of the 
this late, will you wait for me? Yes. <laughs> you promised it, I was doing nothing but this. <laughs> So we're not starting just yet. We'll go ahead and brief you again. Uh, we're having a press conference here at Hilton, Guam. Uh, we are talking about Leadership for Hope and Healing Guam. That's the nonprofit that was established earlier this month uh, for clergy sexual abuse claims. And I think we're almost ready to start. And so what, who you actually see in the bottom of the screen earlier, that was a former U.S. attorney, Alicia Limtiaco. She was the former U.S. attorney for Guam and the CNMI. She, um, she resigned last month, yeah, last March. It was in March. She last month uh, because she, at, that was actually at the request of uh, the Trump administration. So she's resigned, and it seems they're gonna, she's going to go straight into work uh, as the chairwoman. That's what we're told. We see again, again we see her inside. Uh, she's preparing to address us, maybe her roles as the chairman. And we're getting the cue that we're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming in on a Sunday. It's much appreciated. Um, as I said before, my name is Mike Caspino, and I am the executive director of Hope and Healing Law. Uh, as we've discussed before, we are an independent corporation charged with resolving and uh, uh, resolving claims of abuse and with helping anybody who has been a victim of abuse. Uh, we are funded by the Archdiocese. The Archdiocese has set up a fund through us. Um, and uh, as much as possible, um, if we can get out our number, 888-649-5288, so that those who are victims can call and get the help that they receive. To give you an update as to where we are with Hope and Healing, we have received dozens and dozens and dozens of calls to our hotline. We are very pleased with the amount of utilization that has occurred. We are very pleased to tell you that we have a number of victims who have been placed into counseling and are getting what they need. Our caseworkers are keeping track of each one of these people and we receive calls on a daily basis. Hope and Healing is working for the victims of Guam right now. Now today we have a very important announcement. 
As we said before, we were going to have a board, a board of local people who are going to be making the important decisions regarding resolution of claims and regarding the determination of what care that people will need going forward for those who are victims of abuse. And I have spoken to literally hundreds of people on the island here. And the first search that I had was for our chairperson. I asked everyone about who is it that has the integrity to lead this board? Who is it that has the character to lead this board? Who is it that has the independence to lead this board? And, and one name kept coming up from all corners of this island. And it was Alicia Limtiaco. Over and over again, people suggested her. And I am pleased today to announce that Alicia has accepted the chairmanship of the Hope and Healing Guam Board. And that we will be filling in, in the coming weeks, the rest of the board. But today we start out with a chairperson that I don't think I personally could be more happy to have associated with our efforts in helping the victims. Alicia. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Caspina. Uh, as chair of the uh, Hope and Healing Board, and on behalf of the soon-to-be-established full board of the Hope and Healing Program and Fund, uh, I am committed to establishing a board that will be victim-sensitive, that will have an understanding of the dynamics of abuse and exploitation, who will be compassionate, who will be fair, who will understand the uh, effects and the impact of trauma on a victim and in their lives. I also believe it's very important to stress that uh, in the discussions I've been having with Mr. Caspina that uh, it has been made clear to me and I have been reassured that this board will be an independent board, that we will not be controlled by the archdiocese, that we are not a board that is here to defend the church or the archdiocese or any perpetrators of clergy abuse, and that we are here to serve the victims and the survivors of abuse. We are here to ensure that their voices are heard. We are here to ensure that justice is served. We also want to stress that this particular process, as we understand it, the hope and healing process, is one that is not intended to be a substitute for any ongoing litigation, that victims have a right to decide and to choose what means by which they want their voices to be heard, and that the board is going to support uh, those choices. Uh, whether the choice is through the court, whether the choice is through this process or any other means, or a combination of any of these particular processes. And so again, uh, on behalf of uh, myself and the uh, board that uh, I will be seeking membership of uh, very, very shortly, uh, we are committed to ensuring that we do the right thing and that we are responsive to the needs of victims and survivors uh, and their families. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, Mr. Kuhn, did, did uh, Attorney Luhan <coughs> or any of his clients have any kind of involvement in choosing the chairmanship of the foundation? I spoke to David Luhan this morning. Um, his initial reaction was very positive, but he said he'd think about it for a couple days. But he said it was a very positive choice. Um, may I also say that I spoke to Attorney uh, Kevin Fowler yesterday. And he also uh, expressed great uh, positive things about uh, Ms. Limtiaco being the board chair. And uh, what about for future membership on the board? Has that been discussed as to whether or not uh, Attorney Luhan or Fowler or any of their clients will be involved in the process of choosing those members? Uh, may I just say this, that they will certainly have influence in those decisions. Can you talk more about the dual boards, one board to oversee you and one board for actually addressing the claims? Certainly. Um, Ms. Limtiaco's board will be the one addressing the claims. There'll be a second board, a smaller board of three people who oversee 
the entire process that are that are a check and balance uh, watching me making sure that the money is being well spent making sure that we're true to our mission making sure that we are doing the right thing so that separate board will be um, will be I think Tuesday we will be announcing that so this board that the attorney in chapel will be uh, this is called the hope and healing Guam board of directors or board of trustees uh, no it's the evaluation board if they will be evaluating the claims, they will be doing the heavy lifting of working to find what is the best way for us to respond to each victim who comes to us. So we have the we have the chairwoman, and then how many board members uh, will be uh, on this evaluation? Board? Another six. So it will six. be seven. And then the smaller board will be three. Three. Yes. It's entirely separate from the. Yes. From this, the evaluation board? Yes. This is a good way for us to have governance to make sure that we're doing everything correctly, to have a lot of eyes on us and make sure that there's transparency. What's what they call that what they call that board, the smaller board? Our incorporators. Incorporators? Board of incorporators. Yes. What's your response to critics of Hope and Healing Guam who's saying that it's a scam, that it may be pickpockets or it's, it's it's not the right thing to do. That court, that it's no substitute for court, like you're saying. Critics. Well, I read some. I read some uh, comments that were made. And the only thing I can tell you is, time and again, we have said that we're here to help people. We are helping people. We're coming through on our promises. Uh, but more importantly, if I can say this, a lot of I saw some comments by off islanders saying that today. This is an on island solution for an on island problem. And that is why we have a chair in Ms. Lim Tiaco. And the people who will be on the board will be Islanders. True, I'm not an Islander, but I, I have no role here with regard to making decisions. My only job is to serve the board and make sure that they have everything they need. So, attorney, uh, in Chapo, you will be the one selecting the board members, or you're one of the individuals selecting the board members? Uh, I have been told that I would have uh, Serious, uh, serious input uh, in in terms of the selection, and so I am sharing my, uh, you know, my input in terms of who, uh, based on my experience, my training, my background, and working with members in our community, uh, would be again sensitive to to victims who understand the dynamics of abuse and exploitation, who uh, are going to be compassionate uh, and are going to be committed to doing the right thing, and so we're looking at. People who, who have that experience, who who really um, want to make sure that we're really serving victims. Which one of the two do you yourself be speaking with any of your clients or victims who call you to the hospital? It would depend, I think. Uh, certainly, uh, if there are victims who would like to speak directly to myself or the board, uh, and we would work through a process to make sure that. Uh, if they have counsel who represent them, uh, if they, uh, or if they don't, but, but we would want to make sure that we're, we're going through a process so that, uh, again, their needs are met, uh, their rights are protected, uh, and, uh, and that uh, this is a process that is not going to re-victimize them. And that was very, very important, that we are not re-victimizing victims. Is there a reason why um, someone with a law background has chosen to head the board I, I think I think that um, in in my going all around this island, it wasn't the legal background per se. It was the character, it was the integrity, and the respect that she garners throughout the island. And um, I know her to be a very humble person, in having to got to know her. But I can say that just about every person I talked to out there had nothing but respect for Ms. Lintiaco and nothing but great things to say about her. That is what struck me. Nothing more than that. I'm sorry, Ms. Lithia, this is a personal question, but we, we're seeing a lot of judges recuse themselves, mm. a lot because they're Catholic. Are you Catholic? I'm Catholic, yes. Do you think that'll affect your opinions, being the Board of Evaluators? Uh, I think given my experience and training and my background, uh, being fair, and objective, uh, at the same time, of course, being victim sensitive, 
uh, in the work I've done in the past uh, and through my career. Uh, these are uh, these are attributes, they're uh, characteristics that I take very, very seriously. So the fact that I'm Catholic uh, is not going to uh, be any sort of impediment that, that would uh, uh, cause any disruption in the process. Uh, and, you know, in fact, in, in terms of some of the discussions with the potential board members, looking at being inclusive uh, in that uh, maybe reaching out to uh, persons who are not Catholic and you know, having a really a good cross-section of our community who can participate uh, actively in, in this commitment that we're talking about. Um, Attorney Lopiaco, um, since you've stepped down Well, this is uh, definitely a transition period for me. Uh, I am still passionate and committed to uh, the areas of work that I've done in, in terms of my career as the Attorney General, as the local prosecutor, uh, as the U.S. Attorney. So in terms of, again, um, exploitation and abuse, uh, whether it be sexual assault, uh, intimate partner violence, uh, human trafficking, uh, child abuse, uh, these are all areas that I'm very familiar with that uh, I believe very strongly uh, that we need to, to do everything we can to, to, help, uh, to help families, to help survivors, to help victims. Yeah, I'm guessing that this role won't take up all of your time as a right. full-time. Uh, is there something else that you're doing full-time um, outside of what you uh, This is still a transition oh, area so for me, yes, yes. And uh, just to clarify, this is a voluntary position, and so all of the board members will also, of course, be serving uh, on a voluntary basis. Are you going to be able to speak on how much money is in the settlement fund? We might, Marvin. At this time, we still have the seed money of a million dollars, but I can tell you that I have been assured by uh, the Archdiocese that certain assets are being liquidated at this time and that money will be going into the fund. Um, and I also can tell you that we have had uh, a, a great amount of dialogue with insurance companies uh, who are going to be working with us also to help fund our efforts. Who is the insurance uh, agency for the uh, Archdiocese? Um, I'm not sure. I'd have to go back to the, uh, the Archdiocese. And do you know which assets are being liquidated? I know that there's a list of assets, but I have not seen that, but I do know that some of them are A number of assets. It's my understanding that a number of assets are are being looked at uh, liquidation. When does the board start evaluating claims? So this is a process that we go through. The first step in the process is to uh, have buy-in from the attorneys, and I've been talking to all of the attorneys. The second step in that process is an evaluation process, where we ask each of uh, the claimants to fill out a questionnaire. The next step is a psychological exam, which they go through. And then the final process is all the information is then synthesized for the board. The board reviews the information, and then we make, uh, we make uh, efforts to compensate based upon that data that we have received. So what we're talking about here, if we do it on a timeline, we're talking about somewhere around midsummer where we start really getting down to the heavy lifting of the board where they're looking at the data. Between now and then, it's kind of the phase where we will be uh, compiling all this information. Are you able to tell us, uh, you mentioned that dozens and dozens of uh, victims have called into the hotline. <coughs> Are you able to say whether any of the alleged perpetrators um, <coughs> have not yet been named in any of the lawsuits? Any that we haven't heard of? We, we preach utmost confidence. In other words, it's confidential when people call it every time. The only thing I can tell you is that none of the claims for that have been called in are recent. That's the first thing we check for. If it's a recent claim that came up, say within the last month, whatever it may be, we want to notify law enforcement right away. So that is something that you will, if it's a new claim or a case you've never heard of? Immediately we will notify law enforcement. So that, has, that situation has not come up as of yet. 
perhaps just to add if there's any mandated reporting that's required, then definitely uh, reports to law enforcement will be made. That's next on my list. That's next. We've been working seven days a week, all day long, every day since we started this. So we're bit by bit getting things done, but he's next on my list that I certainly would most most like to speak to. I'm just curious why uh, you told the press conference on Sunday. Are you leaving on that one? No, uh, we're working seven days a oh. week, sorry. <laughs> we are, I'm not leaving. <laughs> but uh, literally every day we're working on this. Our case workers, uh, they are modern day saints. Uh, they're up all night long talking to victims. How many do you have? I can't. How many was that? Case workers. Uh, we have three case workers at present, and they're working shifts. And uh, I can tell you that they're available 24 7 at 888 649 5288. So please, anybody out there, even if, you, if you're not a victim, but you know someone who is a victim, please ask them to call this number. We're we have great people who are standing by who want to help today. I'm so pleased to tell you our caseworkers are so happy. They're ecstatic when, when they talk to someone who's hurting, get them into counseling, and then hear back from the victim how great that counseling was and how much motivation they have to continue counseling and to get better. And it, it just, I've seen our, our caseworkers literally cry over it. They're so happy to be helping these people. And I really, really mean it that if you feel that this weight, this tremendous weight on your shoulders of having been abused and you can't talk to anyone, so many of them have said, we, we can't tell anybody, just call this number and we'll get you somebody to talk to and you'll feel so much better. Um, your three case workers are local? Yes. And you said the remainder, remainder of the board would be announced early as early as Tuesday? Uh, Tuesday will be our board of incorporators and the rest of the board were taking our time. Um, I think you can see that when we took our time, we got an awesome candidate, so we're gonna do the same thing with the board here. So will you have another press conference on Tuesday? For the board of incorporators? Yes. And that board of incorporators will have a chair, chair, chairperson and then two yes. members. You said that the, the survivors would have to fill out an evaluation a or questionnaire. A questionnaire? Yes. Uh, would you make that public, the questionnaire? No, because it'll be, it will involve their own confidential information about them. Oh, no, that's the question. Question. Just oh, just the so form? that they can prepare themselves that you, uh, how, how complicated so the, it is. So it won't be very complicated. It's really the what happened is the essence of it. Um, and I will, I'm working with the other attorneys like Mr. Lujan and, and Mr. Fowler, we'll work together to come up with a questionnaire. So I have questionnaires I've used in the past, but I actually work with the other side to make sure that everybody's satisfied with it. And I, I have to ask them if they're okay with that. But the completed questionnaire is all gonna be confidential information that comes out of it. Yeah, but I can tell you this, there's nothing tricky to it, it's really just tell us what happened, when it happened, and that's it. And it would have like name, age, all residence, of Again, your uh, Hope and Healing Guam can help even victims off island, right? Absolutely. We have a network ready of counselors that we can refer people to even off island. Can you tell us whether somebody from off island already? I can't. I think we'd be betraying our, our confidentiality. We really, I do really want to be careful with that. I don't want anybody to, to I, I want everybody to feel they can call this number. 
and they'll never ever say anything about who they are. Tomorrow there will be a Baptist conference on the um, cases filed in federal court. court. Will open hearing wall. Like, will you be there too? Not at all. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, I think it was in uh, Eastern Kentucky. You mentioned that um, the the client, the defendant, would have every discretion to move forward with the case if they wanted to. Um, and that the Pope and Willie won't um, impede upon that. What would, what, what would the purpose of Pope and Willie be then if, if there's already a court case? I mean, just to provide uh, services, counseling services, that's, that's the main goal. Um, my question? Um, yeah, either. We're here either way. Um, so some people might say to themselves, I want to go through the court system. I want to take two, three years and go through all the discovery and everything else, or they can come to us and we will sit down and resolve their claim. We will provide them with counseling. We will provide them with money. We will provide them with money to make hope that somehow, I mean, I hate to say it this way, you can never give money to make up for that kind of pain, but we will provide them with compensation. And, and we will get them back on a path on their life much, much sooner than if they go through the litigation process. Is it for or is it and for? So, so could they continue the litigation and still be part of public and receive compensation? Of course. They can go any way they like. It, it's every, every, uh, every person, every victim or survivor situation is going to be uh, addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and so uh, no one is going to be forced or compelled to go through this process, it is the choice and the right of the victim or survivor to decide what they want to do. Uh, our position as the board would be that this is a program or process that's available, and if a person chooses it, then we are here to do what we can to uh, to help right, and to assist victims. Any other questions? Thank you all so much, especially for coming in on a Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so you heard it first. Uh, that's former U.S. Attorney Alicia Lemtiaco, who's been named the chairwoman for the Board of Evaluators for Hope and Healing Guam. She's the second named member for the since the establishment of the board. Again, uh, we heard uh, we heard from Michael Caspino. He's the executive director. He was announced earlier this month. Um, Alicia Lemtiaco will serve as the chairwoman of the Board of Evaluators. So they. She'll be directly involved with addressing the claims uh, and doing the settlements and providing that, that um, those spiritual guidance and they'll get you those services. Again, the number to call is 188-649-5288. They can confirm that they've received dozens upon dozens of phone calls from survivors of clergy sex abuse, uh, that they're getting them help, that there's three caseworkers ready to take your call 24-7. Um, they have also talked about, uh, they've met with all most two, at least two of the attorneys so far, that's attorney Kevin Fowler and attorney David Lujan, who are both optimistic about this program. Again, um, at least three attorneys. So the third one would be attorney Anthony Perez. They said that they have to talk to him next. We also asked um, Ms. Alicia Lentiaco if she was Catholic, because we're seeing a lot of um, the legal community recuse themselves from this case because they're Catholic. I was, at least we saw a lot of judges do so because of that. She did say she's Catholic, but that it won't impede on her on her ability to be fair. Again, she was chosen because of her integrity, her character, and independence. And she's actually just been off the job as U.S. Attorney. Uh, she just resigned as U.S. Attorney for Guam and the CNMI uh, last month, and that was at the request of the Trump administration. So we can expect to hear more from 
from Hope and Healing Guam as early as Tuesday, and that's when they'll announce their board of incorporators. So this is a, a second board from the seven-member board. This is a second board. It'll be three members, and they will be tasked with being like the watchdog for Mr. Kispino as the executive director, and they will be announced as early as Tuesday. Again, part of this board will be to um, to pay out to pay out settlements for for those making claims of clergy sex abuse. And Mr. Kispino, Mr. Mike Kispino, the executive director, did confirm that they still have that, just that $1 million of seed money, but they are reassured, they're assured from the Archdiocese of Pagania that they're in the process of liquidating, uh, liquidating assets in order to keep the fund healthy. Um, they're also in talks with insurance companies, and there's a list of assets. Already some of these assets are on the market. Again, uh, for more of this story, just keep it locked to KUAM. Thank you.